Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today in our fourth live webinar. My name is Iris Hima Leroy. I'm an Associate Professor of Geriatric Psychiatry at the Global Brain Health Institute, Trinity College, Dublin. And I'm one of the directors of the Dementia Academy, which aims to support the knowledge and practice of frontline clinicians. When we started this journey many weeks ago, we were in an evidence-free zone. Now as time has progressed and over 3 million people worldwide have been infected by the virus and more evidence is available, there are now over 7,000 medical and scientific publications related to the virus or the disease COVID-19. Now, the majority of this is in the preprint form. And unfortunately, still only a tiny proportion of this literature relates to dementia. Yet this is one of the most common comorbidities of coronavirus. So today we've tried to add to our growing resource hub of dementia-related COVID literature by presenting a collection of updates, including some of the outputs of last weekend's European Academy of Neurology meeting, which was online. And we've collected the information under three themes. First of all, we'll touch on epidemiology, revisiting some of our earlier questions from previous webinars. We'll say a few words about delirium and then neuropsychiatric symptoms related to COVID-19. And as always, we strive that our information we share is practical, meaningful, and accurate. So today we have three speakers on our panels, and uh, their, view is, their views are their own and do not necessarily represent the views of the institutions they work for. So first of all, we have uh, Dr. Joseph Kane, who's a clinical academic and geriatric psychiatrist from Queen's University, Belfast. Hello, everybody. We have Dr. Clara dominguez Vivero, a neurologist from Spain and an Atlantic Fellow for Equity and Brain Health from the Global Brain Health Institute, Trinity College, Dublin. Hello, everybody. And Clara has been curating our Dementia COVID-19 resource hub since the start of the pandemic, and this can be found on the Dementia Academy website. And then finally, we have Dr. Yao Hua Chen, who's also an Atlantic Fellow for Equity in Brain Health at the Global Brain Health Institute, Trinity College, Dublin. And Yao is a neurogeriatrician from Lille, France. Hi, everyone. So let's jump right in. I'm going to start with asking Joe to tell us a little bit about the epidemiology. Um, so Joe, one of the very first discussions we had in these webinars was regarding the spread of COVID-19 in the community of people living with dementia. And there's been a lot of confusion about the numbers. So can you enlighten us about what proportion of people with dementia have been affected by the disease of coronavirus or indeed infected by the virus, in other words, being virus positive? Thanks. This is a really good example of what you're talking about, whereby we have a bit more evidence than we did a few weeks ago, um, but we don't have quite as much evidence as we would like, certainly when it comes to patients with dementia. And the closest thing that I have seen in terms of individuals that have actually had COVID and therefore tested positive on a COVID um, antibody test have been two large studies that have been done, um, one in Germany and one in Los Angeles. And they've been interesting because they have looked at entire populations um, as least as well as possible and testing the individuals who have had it and who have not had it. In both cases, I was quite surprised at how low the rates of antibody positivity were. So in LA, it was just over 4.3% of participants in their study um, tested positive for COVID-19 antibodies. And although we don't have that broken down by comorbidity, um, we, do have, um, we do have the knowledge that it's slightly lower in over 55s. It was about 4.1 in over 55s. The other really interesting preprint that, the, that is out there is from um, a town in Germany called Gangelt, which suffered quite a severe outbreak of COVID-19. So the levels are much higher. Even though it was quite a severe outbreak there, only about 15% of individuals are now testing positive for COVID-19 antibody. Um, and again, this was only very, very slightly lower in over 65s. So whatever happens in terms of interpreting this kind of complex data, there's going to be considerable variation between regions, considerable variation between countries. But um, what is clear is that we're probably looking at somewhere between 5 to 10% zero positivity for, for most different regions. And I suppose that's backed up to a degree by the UK office National statistics saying yesterday that it was around 7% in the UK, 
what does appear to be the case is that it's slightly lower in older individuals, but not as low as we would like when we consider the risk factors, the important risk factors that affect this population. So hopefully there'll be more data on this in the coming weeks. Thank you very much, Joe. So I think we've got still quite a ways to go before we get good clarity on that. And I think the next question reflects the same issue, um, namely that estimates of the case fatality rate, the CFR, the proportion of diagnosed people who die, have ranged from 0.1 to 15%. Now, what proportion of COVID-19 deaths have been in people with dementia? This is another area in which there's been a lot of development with respect to the data. When we, when we looked initially at the data um, that, was, that emerged at the very start of the outbreak, particularly the, the data that was coming out of China, um, the, it related mostly to inpatients and it related mostly to younger patients. Uh, and we knew at the time that didn't quite represent the full picture. Over the past few weeks, we've started to see a bit more evidence with respect to the community and with respect to nursing homes, and it has been very sobering, very concerning reading. Um, the UK Office of National Statistics um, indicated that during March and April, nearly four times the quantity of people um, that died in hospital died in care homes. So you're looking at somewhere between um, you know, 3,000 for hospital deaths over two months and, and over 12,000 for um, individuals in care homes. Um, and they note as well that the most commonly recorded comorbidity on UK death certificates has been dementia. And that's been 25% of all COVID-19 deaths. However, at the time we did recognize that much of the recording is related to, particularly in care homes, it's related to how well the testing has been conducted and how well the recording of um, death certificate data has been. We know that traditionally those are less than optimal. So a different way of looking at this is, using, is looking at the number of excess deaths that have, that, that have occurred in nursing homes. And again, the Office of National Statistics indicate that there were 20,000 more deaths in nursing homes than would have been expected in a normal March and April. And it's fair to say that COVID-19 must have had a significant contribution to that. When you factor in the fact that around 60 to 80 percent of individuals within care homes have a diagnosis of dementia or another cognitive disorder, um, we have to assume that a much, much larger proportion of COVID-19 deaths, much larger than the 25%, um, are, are, are made up of individuals with dementia. And this isn't just a UK problem. Um, when you look at the data from other countries, um, over 60% over of the deaths in Ireland have been from nursing homes. Um, France has had very similar figures to the UK. And, and in Canada, um, over 80% of the deaths have been from nursing homes. And again, they'll have similar representation of individuals with dementia. So it's, it's a concern. It's something which um, is definitely growing in the public's consciousness. And again, hopefully it'll become a bit clearer as, as data gets published over the next few weeks and months. Thank you, Joe. That's very helpful. On a related note, can you be a little bit more specific as to what degree of risk a diagnosis of dementia confers with regards to either the virus or the disease of coronavirus? And also more specifically, what about Alzheimer's disease itself or APOE4 status? This is something which has been a really interesting development over the past few weeks. Um, when we looked at the initial data that came out, again, it was related to inpatient admissions in hospitals. And it suggested that in those inpatients that dementia was a risk factor, but it was a fairly, um, fairly low down the list when it came to comorbidities. So it was below obesity, it was below cardiovascular disease and respiratory disease. And it was felt uh, in inpatients to confer only about the 25 to 30% risk. However, the data on that has developed considerably since. There have been some interesting studies emerging from groups in Connecticut and from Exeter using the UK Biobank. Um, and these have been huge sample sizes of well phenotyped, well genotyped patients. Um, and in a preprint that they have um, that's under review, I understand at the moment, using 16,000 different people across the UK, 
they indicate that dementia is the single biggest risk factor for COVID-19 related death um, in individuals over 65. And far from the 25 to 30% increase in risk, they're suggesting that it's, it's actually a kind of threefold risk um, in people with dementia. In women, it might be even higher. So in women, we might be talking as much as a five-fold risk. Now, it's worth remembering that we can't necessarily say that this is due to the pathological processes driving dementia itself. There are a lot of indirect influences um, related to dementia, related to dementia care, related to comorbidities, which could also be influencing this. But what is clear is that it's becoming um, a definite area of concern and that dementia is quite clearly a risk factor in and of itself. With respect to the APOE4 um, um, question, that, that, that's another re really interesting development. Again, it has used the UK Biobank data. Um, they looked at over 600 um, individuals with COVID-19 who had already been genotyped prior to COVID-19 as part of different studies. They found that people who were homozygous for APOE4, which we know of course carries at least a tenfold um, increased risk of dementia in individuals that, have, that are homozygous, um, they found that, that APOE4 homozygous patients were over twice as likely to die from COVID-19 and be admitted to hospital with COVID-19 than um, people who were homozygous for APOE3. Um, so that was even the case when you removed all the patients that had diagnoses of dementia and diagnoses of other comorbidities like cardiovascular disease. This is really interesting because it might indicate that there might be common mechanisms underpinning both Alzheimer's dementia and COVID-19 infection. And the authors did propose some mechanisms by which this might be the case. Um, one of them being that they, they suspect that um, the same mechanisms could be involved in regulating, regulating the inflammatory pathways that can be um, triggered in both conditions. And another that perhaps might have something to do with the ES2 receptor, which we think um, allows um, COVID-19 and other coronaviruses into the actual cell. So this is research in its very, very early stages, and we need a lot more information before we can say this is a causal risk. But it's definitely an interesting observation. It definitely gives us a little bit of an insight into a possible one mechanism of many that could be contributing to this in increased risk. Thank you, Joe. That certainly moved on quite a bit since even a few weeks ago. So that will be an emerging line of evidence that we'll want to follow very closely. You've already touched on the infection and death rates in long-term care facilities being so high and that have been in the, public, in the public headlines these past weeks, particularly in countries like Sweden, Scotland, Russia, the UK, particularly being hard hit. Can you just point out why the mortality rates might be so high in long-term care facilities and also what measures are being put in place in these facilities to try to reduce the risk? So this is where we see the effects of the kind of statistics in real life. We kind of see how it actually influences the care of our patients. Um, and um, we, we see both sides of the coin with it as well. I think that there's always going to be a large number of factors which are contributing to something like mortality, particularly in nursing home population. And addressing any one of these probably isn't in and of itself enough to address that mortality. It's likely to be a number of different measures implemented in a number of different ways and tailored to different situations. In terms of the factors that might be influencing the mortality, um, the, the first of course is the inpatient population. We've established that dementia is probably a significant risk factor that makes up a lot of nursing home residents, but also they're generally older, they're generally more frail, and they generally have a higher number of significant comorbidities than, than even older people in the community. Another factor is that in the early stages of the pandemic, we changed the way we looked at services and we changed the way that services were delivered. So there was a marked increase in activity when it comes to advanced care planning, when it comes to palliative care. Uh, and my colleagues in those specialties were very assertive in outreaching into nursing homes and upskilling other professionals when it came to delivering good quality palliative care in homes. The fact is that some of those patients 
uh, before COVID-19 may have been transferred to hospital and they may have died in hospital rather than nursing homes. There's also other disease specific factors. Um, you recall that at the start of the pandemic, we were very, very focused on pyrexia and fever. We were very focused on respiratory illness. And the way we have looked at COVID-19 infection has evolved over the past few weeks. We're a lot more conscious, as I think Clara will touch on, of things like delirium and how that can be a presenting factor and how um, it doesn't always fit the neat little um, clinical guidelines that were initially proposed at the start. There are also much more extrinsic factors and really in the editorials in the major journals have started to discuss some of these over the past few weeks. Um, in the UK, PPE has been a massive concern um, as have the mechanism of discharge from um, hospitals in the nursing homes and the difficulties that that might have caused. You might recall from the initial outbreaks in the US and Washington state that one of the major issues in the spread of COVID-19 was the fact that care home workers were working multiple jobs in multiple nursing homes and that really propagated the spread within nursing homes. In terms of addressing those issues, again, it's not going to be a single factor, but some of the things that we have seen is that we've seen restrictions on visitors, both in terms of personal and professional visitors. And this has led to a much more widespread adoption of things like video chat and remote consultations. In many cases, residents have been encouraged to stay in their rooms and stay away from communal areas. Again, this is something which we know probably has detrimental effects, but is certainly well-meaning. Um, and in some, in some instances has proved very effective. Routine regular testing is another thing that has been proposed. That would seem sensible to me, given the fact that we have seen that in nursing homes, as many as 50% of patients who are COVID-19 positive have had no symptoms whatsoever. Um, but again, there are drawbacks to that in that those of us that have had um, a swab for COVID-19 will tell you that it's not a pleasant experience. And certainly for our vulnerable individuals who don't quite understand the situation as well as we would like, repeated testing might pose, pose problems to our, our patients' well-being. So whatever happens, it's going to have to be a multifactorial approach. It's going to have to be tailored to individual situations. And we have to accept that every single one of those measures will have benefits, but also have significant drawbacks. And uh, I think it's going to be quite some time before you figure out exactly what they're going to be. It's, it's going to be a case of trial and error. But I think that um, certainly we'll get some consensus on effective ways to manage outbreaks in car homes. Thank you very much, Joe. And certainly people with many years of experience working in managing care homes have been uh, putting their expertise together to come up with fantastic plans and they've been doing a really good job at supporting people living in the care homes as well as their families. So our congratulations to them in this very difficult times. Joe, you did mention delirium. I'm going to switch themes now and um, ask Clara to answer the next few questions. So a clinical issue of vital importance to people with dementia, of course, is the risk of delirium and the impact delirium may have on an individual's symptoms of dementia and the cause. Clara, can you tell us about whether there is a higher incidence of delirium with COVID-19? Yes, uh, so we first uh, have to be reminded that in a normal context, there's about 10-15% of hospitalized general medical patients that develop delirium, and around 50-70% of critically ill patients. So during this situation, we could expect the numbers to be higher. Uh, for several reasons. First of all, because the disease, as we know, COVID-19 attacks uh, more the elderly, which are also more prone to delirium. Then the main presentation is a respiratory infection, which we all know that uh, in many, many occasions leads to delirium symptoms. But on top of that, we also have to think that delirium is not going to only be happening in COVID-19 patients because there's a great number of patients that are hospitalized right now without COVID-19, but they are suffering 
the same measures, strict measures of isolation and consequences of the pandemic. And this has also an influence in the rate of delirium. So there's, there are already several papers uh, talking about delirium in COVID-19 and the numbers they report are surprisingly low. So the first one uh, is from earlier in the year uh, of Mao and collaborators, and they studied a group of 214 patients. They found that about a third developed neurological symptoms. And of these, like of the total, sorry, 7.5% had uh, in their charts something that was described as impaired consciousness. And this was the closest they could get to the delirium diagnosis. So just 7.5%. Then in another study with 99 patients, they reported like around 9% of patients that presented or developed uh, confusion during the disease. <clears throat> and then uh, we have another study of Helms and collaborators, and they report like about 20-30% of COVID-19 patients that present with uh, delirium during their hospitalization. And this is even higher if they get very sick and they get in the ICU closer to what I said at the beginning in another situation, like around 60%, 70%. So what's the explanation with, uh, for these lower um, numbers that we are finding? Well, um, probably because underreporting delirium is very common, uh, particularly in studies that are based on reviewing charts. So if you're not screening deliberately for delirium, you are probably missing most of it. Uh, in this uh, issue, the literature is quite consistent. And it says that about 75% of delirium cases will be missed if they are not, uh, if, if we are not looking for them, if we are not screening for them. And so my understanding is that during this situation, uh, most health facilities are not really screening for delirium. So they are missing most of it. And these studies that I mentioned are based on chart re review. So they are not uh, addressing this specifically. Actually, the studies uh, say that if there is an inc uh, a reported incidence lower than 10%, it's very likely that it's underestimated. So this is what we, we find in these reports. And then we also have to consider uh, the incidence of delirium is very important, of course, and we have to look at it, but we also have to consider that even if the incidence is low, uh, the consequences of delirium during this pandemic are more important than ever because the behaviors that normally delirious patients have uh, become much more disruptive. So the chances that it uh, like really disturbs the very strict uh, measures taken in the unit, that it puts at risk other patients or, or workers are much higher than in normal circumstances. So this is why screening for delirium and treating delirium becomes particularly important during this time. Thank you, Clara. And it's hope that perhaps some of the learning from this particular period during the pandemic will roll over to when we get back to normal times, if such a thing will exist. Yeah. Um, can you please tell us a little bit more about um, the etiology and the pathways of delirium that we've been seeing during the pandemic? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, there's mm, several reasons. So delirium is always multifactorial and, and I think now more than ever. So first of all, and I guess Yao is later gonna maybe talk uh, more about this, but we all heard or read that the, the virus can actually invade the central nervous system. So it's not only the SARS-CoV-2, but only other coronaviruses can invade the neural system. But this, uh, as we already know, by uh, studies in SARS-CoV-1 and MERS, tends to happen quite late in the disease, and it's rare. So some cases of delirium may be related to this, but this is not what we should be assuming is happening to our patients. Also, uh, when is the virus causing the neural disturbance, uh, it usually comes with seizures, with uh, signs of increased intracranial pressure, so it's not just the delirium. There's more things going on. Then what is more important, uh, according to literature regarding delirium, is the inflammation. So 
the viral infec infection triggers an inflammatory state that really affects the CNS. Uh, this is mainly mediated by T li lymphocytes T and also by neutrophils and monocytes that invade the central nervous system and cause a uh, blood-brain barrier disruption. And this uh, leads to neuronal edema. So this could be in more cases that one of the factors leading to delirium in patients. <clears throat> and then the main factors that we normally find in other diseases, such as, for example, the effects of other organs and systems failures. Uh, in the case of COVID-19, uh, very importantly, the respiratory system, which, which is mainly affected. So lower levels of oxygen, higher levels of uh, carbon dioxide. And then there's also some case reports on hyponatremia that we know is very related with confusion and delirium. So all these kinds of, these kind of metabolic uh, disbalances can lead to delirium. And then finally, what is really particular of this situation is all the environmental factors. So we have the sedative strategies that we're using. We have prolonged me mechanical ventilation time. We have all the isolation in the units, the personal wearing, personal protective equipment that is very despersonalizing. Uh, we have to think that patients spend most of their time alone in their rooms, no family, no communication with anyone the health staff that gets in the room gets in completely disguised. They cannot see their face. They barely interact. So this is like a factory for the delirium. Also, many of the measures that we normally take to try to decrease the incidence of delirium, like mobilization, engaging in activities, all this is gone. And not only for COVID-19 patients, for all patients. So this is probably the main reason that we may expect the living rates to, to be higher. Thank you, Clara. A factory for delirium. I think that kind of says it all, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, so I guess our management approaches obviously have to be sort of multifaceted. Can you just tell us a little bit about a good management approach to delirium in the current circumstances? Yeah. Um, well, there's a lot not a lot, but a few papers on editorials uh, with recommendations on this. Also, uh, a guideline, a nice guideline. And well, first of all, we all know delirium is, is um, avoidable. So if we establish the appropriate measures, we can decrease it in 30, 40% rate. Uh, and we should aim, like, I mean, the situation is really overwhelming. Uh, but we still should aim to embed the delirium prevention in the COVID-19 treatment. First of all, because it's really important for the patient and his recovery, but also from a, a resource allocation point of view, the more delirium we can avoid, the less time patients are going to spend in their beds, in their hospital rooms, and in their ICU beds. So delirium is also going to prevent us from having free beds, free ventilators. So the first thing that I see all the literature recommends is a screening for the delirium. This is essential. So as you could see, when I talk about the incidence, the problem is that the studies we have are basically based on review chart or on, on health settings where they really were not looking for the delirium. They just wrote down if the patient was confused. So Actually, the recommendations, for example, for, from the World Health Organization or the Center for Disease Control do not include this, the, the screening for the delirium thing. Only the World Health Organization um, encourages us to look for atypical presentations, but they, they, they didn't think about the delirium. But this should, we should keep in mind and it should be important, particularly with the Lily patients. Um, also, because in many of these patients, uh, the disease can be uh, not detected because many of them do not get fever. When they get hypoxic, they don't get dyspnea, symptomatic dyspnea. And then 40% of the chest X-rays are normal. But in the elderly, the delirium can be like a vital sign. So if we look for it, we will be discovering much more cases of COVID-19 probably than if we, if we don't. It should be like some kind of red flag for us, particularly when treating with dementia and, and elderly patients. 
regarding uh, prevention, um, there's several strategies for delirium prevention. Um, they are, uh, there are many tools um, built for this, and one of them is the ABCDEF bundle. So there's two papers that have tried to adapt these measures to the current situation, of course, acknowledging that it's gonna be more difficult than before to do these things. So um, they are based in six points. The first one is assessment of pain. So we should assess periodically for pain, particularly in patients that are in prone position to facilitate breathing, and particularly also keep in mind that COVID can also cause neuropathy. So we should assess for that. Uh, we should try to keep a stop in sedation and ventilation daily in the cases that this is happening for the patient. And when it's not possible, try to reduce it daily a little bit to check uh, the state of the patient. Uh, the sedation must be just the needed for the ventilation, nothing else. Um, we should check daily for delirium, facilitate orientation, provide glasses and hearing aids, and limit the use of CNS active medications. And we should try our best to, to favor early mobility and adapt rehabilitation services, but they acknowledge that it is very difficult. And well, then another part is providing visual and hearing contact with family. So this is one big problem because many hospitals and care settings are forbidding completely visits for, for patients. In case they opt for, uh, for this option, um, the papers I reviewed propose that the directors or the management of the hospital should provide phone and video devices to facilitate communications of the patients with their families if possible. This also means that some of the health workers must devote some time for this. The alternative is not, is not better, that they, they stay isolated for 15 days, completely isolated. But then there are also like quite a lot of groups advocating for actually allowing one family member or one close one to be with the patients with the proper uh, security measures, but that this is possible. And it has, it actually, I think, has been done in several places, I think, uh, in in the hospital in Lille where they used to work and also here in my area in Spain, not at the beginning, but when the situation got a little bit under control, they let them with all the PP uh, things on just to be with them. Um, yeah, so this is very important. There's uh, the hospital elder life program has developed a, a toolkit to provide delirium prevention that um, will be uploaded also to the to the PowerPoint. And then finally, pharmacological interventions. So there are some early papers and cases, case reports that advocate for a more aggressive pharmacological approach during COVID-19 situation, considering that we don't have the same uh, resources regarding personnel and also not a lot uh, at the same time. Um, there's actually a paper from Sanders and collaborators that advocates that this um, traditional st strategy of starting low, anti-treating and slow antipsychotics, maybe we should skip that and start a little higher. But all this is very questionable. And all the papers that talk about that really, what they want, really want to stress is that we need to keep in mind that we, our aim is still to avoid the use of, this, of these drugs. So we should try our best to avoid the use of these drugs, but then maybe we have to be more flexible than normal when they are needed. Um, and finally, there is also important to try to improve the sleep cycle and to avoid the sleep deprivation. So all the measures regarding light, um, avoiding entering the room when it's uh, time for sleeping is very important. And there's also a very um, brief editorial regarding the use of melatonin that actually apparently is very used in uh, ICUs uh, to prevent um, the disruption of the sleep cycle. And they suggest it may be useful, but actually there's very little on, on pharmacological uh, approach for, for the lium. And what everyone says is like, try to avoid drugs and go for the environmental measures as much as you can, considering the situation.
Thank you, Clara. That's an absolute wealth of information. Certainly nothing is straightforward, but all that information will be on the, in the resource hub and also you've made some PowerPoint slides. So thanks very much for that. And we'll come back to the issue of antipsychotic use just before the end of our discussion, I think. Um, I'm going to switch themes now. We're going to talk a little bit about the neuropsychiatric aspects of COVID-19. And um, I'm going to ask Yang Hua the next question. So um, as you know, many weeks ago, we first had the clinical reports of neurological and neuropsychiatric complications related to COVID-19. Can you outline some of the key findings being reported in the literature now, at least weeks later? Yeah, um, so now we are having more and more data from some uh, small cohort study. Uh, and also before that, we are having some uh, case reports. And I think uh, regarding the neurological symptoms and neuropsychiatric manifestations, uh, here we should separate uh, symptoms in the acute phase and in the uh, recovery phase. And in the acute phase, the studies that have been already um, uh, talked by, by Clara, the one from Wuhan, uh, they showed that up to 36% of patients with COVID-19 presented uh, neurological uh, symptoms. And the, this prevalence uh, could even be higher if people uh, uh, had severe um, COVID-19 uh, symptoms because there was another study uh, coming from France. Um, uh, people, they assessed um, patients admitted in ICU, so uh, severe uh, uh, patients. And actually, they describe it up to 80 percent, eight zero percent of patients who, who presented some neurological symptoms. And some of them, as Clara already said, um, presented uh, confusion and delirium. And they assessed uh, based on the uh, confusion assessment uh, method in the ICU. So uh, this is about the prevalence and what kind of neurological symptoms that patients can present when they have uh, COVID-19. Um, so actually, uh, last week, I attended the virtual uh, conference of EAN, the European uh, Academy of Neurology, and Dr. Elena Mroro uh, presented uh, the results from a very nice initiative uh, from EAN. It, it was an online survey, um, and people can send, uh, so physicians can, uh, can, can send uh, the neurological symptoms that uh, they observed uh, for their patients. And the most common uh, symptoms were uh, headache, um, anosmia, and uh, impaired uh, consciousness. And this is from the survey. And now uh, there is also there are also um, uh, national registries uh, all around the world, and also in European countries, uh, in, in Italy, Spain, France, and the UK, and uh, also Portugal, etc. And uh, these national uh, registries about uh, patients having neurological symptoms uh, are very important. They provide us uh, very precious uh, information. And uh, regarding these registries, uh, for example, in UK, the most common uh, neurological manifestation was stroke, and most uh, commonly uh, the, the ischemic stroke. But they also saw uh, hemorrhagic stroke or vasculitis, but the most common was ischemic stroke. And the second one uh, was uh, encephalopathy. And then after that, uh, encep uh, encephalitis and meningitis. And the less uh, common were um, uh, Guillain-Barré syndrome or uh, some uh, impairment of uh, cranial nerves such as uh, fascial uh, palsy. And um, why uh, they are having these neurological symptoms. So Clara already talked a little bit about that. So as the coronavirus, uh, SARS-CoV-2 have uh, also uh, very uh, neurotropic um, uh, characteristics and we know that they can enter the, uh, the brain uh, through the olfactive bulb. That also uh, may explain why people experience this anosmia. And they can have this direct effect on the uh, cerebral, uh, of, uh, central nervous system, uh, or they can have some indirect effects. So that's also why people having this stroke, because this disease induces a pro-thrombotic state uh, so the large vessels uh, will have uh, occlusion uh, because of this thrombotic uh, state. Uh, 
And of course, uh, this virus can also induce some pro-inflammatory uh, response and, and uh, immune response, uh, which could explain uh, encephalopathy um, or, or Guillain-Barré syndrome. And interestingly, even when you have this uh, meningitis or encephalitis because of the direct uh, effect of the virus, and in most of cases, uh, the, 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 the PCR for the virus in CSF was negative. I think I, I only saw one case with meningitis and seizures, and uh, they, they, they got this uh, positive result. Otherwise, it was always uh, negative. And most often, people will develop neurological symptoms uh, at uh, one week to 10 days after the first uh, COVID-related uh, uh, symptoms such as uh, fever. Um, and in the recovery phase, we don't have enough data, but it seems that one third of uh, patients at discharge will present this executive function. So impaired attention uh, or uh, some kind of um, emotional liability. And we should uh, be very careful and uh, follow up uh, these patients in the long term, because from the other coronavirus experience, uh, such as SARS or MERS, we know that uh, even uh, for three years after, people will have this, this executive function, uh, sleep disorder, and some kind of uh, post-traumatic disorders uh, as well. But for now, we don't have enough data to support that, and we don't have enough time. Of course, we, we, we have to follow up uh, these patients. Thank you, Yao. That's an absolute masterclass in, in explaining that. Can we just hone a little bit in on the specifics of people with dementia and cognitive impairment, is there any specific neuropsychiatric manifestations related to COVID-19 in this population? Yeah, yeah, of course. So actually, <laughs> there are not so many uh, data uh, regarding uh, the specific neurological or neuropsychological presentation of people with dementia when they have uh, diagnosed uh, COVID-19. Um, we have some, uh, I, I actually two case reports, uh, maybe there are more, but I did not find them, but I only found two case reports uh, about uh, people with dementia and um, what they reported is very atypical symptom. So uh, patients without fever, without any respiratory symptom, uh, but uh, diarrhea or uh, dysphagia um, or some kind of uh, um, uh, hypoactive, but not uh, very um, uh, aggressive agitation. And um, in some case, in, in these cases, actually, it was hard to make the diagnosis. And in one, the diagnosis was made uh, post-mortem. And in the other one, it was made on the second or third uh, sampling, uh, the, the swab uh, sampling. And there is also one study from Italy, uh, uh, retrospectively, so, uh, so they diagnose people in the acute care setting. So we have this bias of if it's um, relevant and, and how accurate was this kind of diagnosis of dementia. Uh, but anyway, they, have the, the, they, they, they showed that the, at first the results of people with dementia and they diagnosed 13% of people having COVID-19 who had also uh, dementia. And in these patients, they showed more uh, delirium presentation. And as, uh, as, uh, as uh, we said before, more hypoactive presentation um, and very uh, less commonly fever and cough, less than 40% of uh, these patients had uh, this kind of, uh, of symptoms. And I saw also a poster from EAN. I suppose they will uh, publish the results very soon from Madrid. And they uh, studied people who died from COVID-19, but they also, so they have very accurate data about their dementia. They have the, the etiology of dementia and, and also the stage. And they did not show some specific presentation in among people with dementia uh, and diagnosed with COVID-19. Yeah. Thank you, Yao. Just sort of a follow-on question. Is there any evidence that the syndrome of dementia worsens or progresses, or the progression accelerates following COVID-19? Yeah, so um, actually we have some data on, on that. Um, so even if, as Kara said, even people with dementia were not diagnosed with uh, 
COVID-19, but in the general environment, because of the lockdown, because of um, the reduced uh, access to their usual facilities, to the daycare center or, or to have their uh, care uh, providers at home. Uh, so people actually living with cognitive impairment are experiencing a lot of neuropsychiatric symptoms and even maybe some of them we don't know about that. So in the general population, we know that the COVID-19 imposed up to 50% of depression, anxiety, uh, and uh, post-traumatic disorders uh, in general population. So this is a study coming from China, but there was another uh, systematic review which confirmed that as well. And um, there's a very recent study from um, uh, Spain. And of course, it's a, in a small sample, but they showed, so they did this NPI, uh, neuropsychiatric environment, uh, in, inventory to, to assess neuropsych neuropsychiatric symptoms before the lockdown and five weeks after the lockdown, because they usually follow up these patients in their, uh, it, it is a daycare center with stimulate, uh, cognitive stimulation programs. So they followed the, the, these patients. And uh, they showed uh, in these patients with dementia or with mild cognitive impairment, uh, the, the NPI score uh, worsened after the, 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 the lockdown. And most uh, commonly, the, they, are, they, have, they observed more agitation and more apathy. And in this study, they also showed that the, hair, the, the, the caregiver or well, the family who, who live with the uh, patients, they reported uh, worse health uh, status. And um, yeah. Thank you, Alan. That leads very interestingly to the next question, which I'm going to direct it to Joe. Um, there have been, as, as you've mentioned, we've generally spent quite a bit of talk time talking about increased agitation, aggression, and behavioral disturbance in people living with dementia uh, in the COVID-19 circumstances. But there's also anecdotal evidence emerging from care homes that some of these behaviors seem to be less common and the rates of BPSD have gone down since the onset of the pandemic. So Joe, I'm gonna ask you to uh, answer this question. Is there anything that can account for lower rates of BPSD in long-term care settings? It's a really interesting observation and actually Yao has kind of touched on a lot of the things which come to mind when we hear that BPSD has, has gone down in some uh, facilities. So I didn't find anything very specific in terms of data, but there have been little clues in terms of the evidence that's out there and certainly evidence in terms of kind of speaking to anecdotal evidence, speaking to care home staff. Um, the first and most important thing for me, if I hear that there has been a decrease in BPSD, um, if there's been a decrease in activity of any type, be it helpful or unhelpful, the first thing that has to spring to mind is hypoactive delirium. And we've, we've, in, we've even seen that in a few patients in our, local, uh, in our local services. We have seen that patients are staying in their bed more often. They're maybe um, less, in, less interested and less engaged in getting up and walking where they would be before. And one of the things that we have to consider is hypoactive delirium. In the study that um, Yoha um, kind of briefly, briefly spoke about, the study from Brescia, um, they, they said that two thirds of patients with dementia presenting with COVID-19 were presenting with delirium. And in the majority of those cases, it wasn't with the hyperactive delirium, but it was with hypoactive delirium. And we know that the delirium detection is pretty poor as is, as Clara, as Clara said, unless you're looking for it, you will miss it. Um, it's pretty poor in hospitals and in nursing homes, there's evidence to suggest that it's even worse. So that would be my, my, my first response to that was, would be check, 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 and double check and to make sure that your patient doesn't have some sort of source of delirium. Um, on a much more positive note, there, it, it's, not, it's not impossible to think that there could be some helpful side effects of things that we've implemented because of COVID-19 that might have helped provide better care for some of our patients with dementia. Um, I'm always struck when I go in nursing homes at the level of activity going in nursing homes. You know, the amount of visitors coming and going, both professionals, family members, you know, hairdressers, um, you know, OTs. It's just, it's like, it's like a constant revolving door sometimes. 
And what I have heard from a lot of nursing home staff has been that because it's quieter, because the stimulus is much, much less, um, that they're actually getting the opportunity to spend much more time with their patients, doing therapeutic activities, doing structured activities, and, and doing them a lot more effectively than, than they were before. So I, I think that's interesting. I think that's possibly something which might be contributing to things. And um, similarly, as, as unpalatable and potentially untherapeutic as, you know, encouraging residents to stay in their rooms rather than engage in communal areas. It, it has meant that in some instances, care home staff have adopted a more structured, um, regular um, approach to actually going and spending 15 minutes with this patient then 15 minutes with that patient and then starting again. So we know these things are really helpful when it comes to dementia care in general, but certainly when it comes to decreasing the prevalence of behavioral and psychological symptoms, I, I think that that could be a really helpful side effect. Of course, when it comes to BPSD, the etiology of these symptoms um, is complex. The management is usually complex and multifactorial. So it's, it's never going to be one or two reasons. It's always going to be a multitude of factors. But I think what we should be doing is looking out for the big important things and delirium at detection and looking after the, the basics of, of good dementia care are a great place to start scrutinizing. Thank you, Joe. That's it's another example of how we're all being pushed to think about things slightly differently as a result of this pandemic. Um, I'd just like to stick with you for a minute because we talked quite a bit about antipsychotic use in the context of long-term care, particularly related to um, BPSD in our earlier webinars. Um, I wonder if you have any updates about that and do we have anything else regarding the links between antipsychotic use and COVID-19? Yeah, I've come across uh, a couple of really interesting papers. Yahua shared this really intriguing paper um, about um, clopromazine. Um, clopromazine, certainly in terms of UK practice, it, it's an atypical antipsychotic. It, it's one which would have been used in decades past, but it certainly isn't commonly used either, either in working age adults or um, in older adults anymore. But um, um, the paper describes uh, the methods that's, that's going to be adopted by a team in Paris who observed that in a psychiatric hospital that staff were experiencing much higher levels of COVID infection than patients. I think it was 14% in staff and only 4% in patients, which is a really interesting observation in itself. And they speculated that one of the reasons why that might be is might be the protective effect of clopromazine. So what they're doing is they, they propose um, conducting a single blind randomized control trial of patients on clopromazine and those that receive care as usual. And they're using a lot of different outcomes, but clinical, serological, um, and radiological. So it's really intriguing. And um, the, the authors actually put across a really intriguing case when it comes to the rationale for doing so. They note that you know, um, laboratory studies have indicated that there is a somewhat protective effect from um, chlorpromazine when exposed to the, the MERS coronavirus. Um, and also the fact that a lot of the bioavailability of it would seem to um, work in its favor in that there's a high concentration in the lungs there is um, a high concentration of chlorpromazine in the saliva, and that therefore there may be a lower possibility of spread amongst individuals. And also they propose a mechanism for this, so it might have something to do with the endocytosis of the coronavirus itself. So it is very interesting, but we have seen the way that the likes of hydroxychloroquine has been reported by the media. And so we need to interpret at all with a bit of caution and we need to be very careful when we're talking about it and communicating about it and um, because clopromazine just like hydroxychloroquine has very common unpleasant and, and very difficult to treat side effects um, and so I, I, I won't be rushing to prescribe it to any of my patients anytime soon but what I will be doing is looking at the evidence of this very interesting study. Another 
interesting paper which I saw last week, which isn't strictly related to COVID-19, but which uh, addresses a lot of points that both Clara and Yohua brought up, is, um, is the fact that um, a, a recent study in South Carolina um, found out that in patients that are treated with haloperidol and other antipsychotics in the intensive care unit, that a third of them are discharged to their place of residence with haloperidol still being prescribed. Um, and that, that's frightening. Um, and when we consider the fact that we have seen, we're seeing quite a lot of ICU admissions with COVID-19, that delirium is very, very common in those ICU admissions. We said about two thirds, maybe more. Um, and the fact that we know that certainly to our patients, antipsychotic prescription, particularly when regular, can be extremely harmful. It's, it was a really scary finding to see. So um, I, I think we need to stick with our tried and tested knowledge here and our do no harm um, attitudes towards dementia care. And that means check, check and double check your patient's um, prescriptions and card X's um, to make sure that they're not prescribed these medications that can be really harmful. So again, um, they have their place in, in the treatment of, of, of acute disturbance, but we should be avoiding them at all costs. And we have no evidence to the contrary to suggest that we should change our approach on them. Thank you, Joe. That's extremely interesting. And uh, you've given some compelling arguments and also advise us not to go rushing off and prescribing chlorpromazine for everybody. But fascinating nonetheless. So we're running out of time. So I'm just going to end with a couple of words because we have really... Uh, left out a group of people here, namely the care partners of people living with dementia. And in previous webinars, we spent some time talking about care partners and how they can be supported. And of course, one of the key aspects is this issue of loneliness and social isolation experienced by care partners, particularly those who are living at home and are feeling very isolated. And we know that the impact of loneliness and social isolation uh, it involves a, a greater risk for poor physical and mental health, poor quality of life, even higher mortality, incident, incident dementia, and so on. So we really need to understand this issue a lot better and gather evidence and data to drive policy and advocacy. So just to let people know, to explore this further in the next week or so, there'll be the launch of the Global Loneliness and Social Isolation Survey. And a subsection of this, I'm very pleased to say, will capture whether respondents are care partners of people with dementia. So this is a general open access, loneliness, social isolation, global survey, but it will, I will be able to identify whether people are care partners of dementia. And those data will be extremely helpful for informing policy and advocacy going forward. So if anyone out there, any of our listeners is interested in pushing this out to their constituents, please send me an email or put it in the chat box, pop survey next to it, and just give us a note saying that I'm allowed to contact you and make sure that you get the survey that you can pass on to the care partners or people with dementia who you may know. So we're very grateful to collect as much data as we can on that so that we can inform policy and advocacy. So on that note, I'm going to end. And first of all, thank you very much to our speakers, to Joe, Clara and Yahua, and of course, to all of you for taking the time out of your very busy schedules to listen to us. And of course, everything will be recorded and all the references to the papers will be in our resource hub. Thank you very much and have a lovely weekend.